Cool. Actually, almost right on time. If I don't trip over one of these chairs, we're going to be in business tonight. Um, I have a short uh, discussion because I only had a half hour. That's all the time that was allotted to me today. So I'll skip a couple of the introductory jokes and get right to it. I actually came in from Chicago just a few minutes ago, and I was um, the one thing I noticed going through O'Hare Airport was I was actually doing the reverse commute today. Um, the Eagles are playing the Packers. So Chicago's about three, three and a half hour drive and it's hard to fly from, from Philly to Green Bay. You either have to cut through Chicago or get off and drive from Chicago. So everybody in the airport was either wearing, from, at least from the terminal I was in, was wearing a Phillies or a Packers jersey. And I'm telling you, it was the weird reverse commute. But I am uh, ecstatic to be here. I'll get you out of here way before the game starts, assuming you're Philly fans. It's hard for me because I grew up as a Giants fan, so it's painful. Uh, but I'm a Bears fan now, so, um, so it's, all, it's all good except for here. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for coming out tonight. and Thanks for... Um, I do this because I actually really enjoy it. I don't do it because I get paid for it. I don't do it because it... it um, it doesn't change my life at all, but what it does is hopefully it gets people engaged in finance. And, and I try to come up with different stories in different cities a couple different times a year. And the, my main purpose is to engage you in finance or what I think finance may look like over the next, um, over the next decade or whatever. Um, I currently run a company called Tasty Trade. We actually own like six different companies. Our brokerage firm is Tastyworks. Tasty Trade is a free, um, it's a free content-based digital platform. We broadcast to 165 countries, or we have customers in 165 countries. About a few million people a month watch it, a few hundred thousand people a week, and a and hundred and something thousand people a day, which in the world of the internet is a tiny little audience. But it's really interesting because it's the most active traders in the world, and we just provide quantitative content. It's all math-based. So this is kind of like a subsection of my discussion tonight about it. I'm going to talk about um, this is a this is a kind of a a talk on what's known as positive drift. Positive drift essentially is what you get paid for taking risk. So people put their money in risk investments because ultimately, you know, you want something that's different from risk-free investments. So we all go through, um, we go through our lives. I don't care what stage of life you are. You could be a millennial right now, a Gen Z or a Gen X or a boomer, whatever. But we all look for asymmetric returns when it comes to kind of how we present, how we just look at our whole life. It's, it's just this, it's the direction we want ourselves to go. Unlimited upside limited downside. Essentially, that's asymmetric return. Something where, you know what, this is the most I can lose, but the most I can make is some unlimited number. And we look at life like that. And I look at trading almost as this kind of a microcosm of life because, because for me, what we get out of trading, we get out of investing, and I don't differentiate between trading or investing. It's the same thing to me. And what we get out of it is real skill with respect to decision making, real skill with respect to um, to learning how to take risk, real skill with being able to process things quickly in our heads because that's what leads to um, a lot of success. So an asymmetric opportunity just means, hey, I want unlimited upside. That's all it is. So the reason for asymmetry in the listed marketplace, the reason I talk about listed marketplaces is because they're theoretically efficient. So the reason for a asymmetry in a listed marketplace is what we call this positive drift. Hey, if you're going to take risk, you're entitled to make money. If you don't want to take any risk, it's called a risk-free return. If you're going to take risk, you should have an opportunity to make money. So the stock market, over time, you invest in it. Things, the economy is supposed to go up. Companies are supposed to be worth more. And over time, stock markets are supposed to go higher. So we call that kind of, um, it's positive drift. And asset pricing models that follow this positive drift, that's called geometric Brownian motion. And geometric Brownian motion is you take all these random events and you string them together and ultimately they just lead to some kind of a, a trending or upward path. That's geometric Brownian motion. It's just lots and lots of random events like the stock market that leads to ultimately, potentially, or in, 
in an asymmetric return, higher prices. So positive drift simply means that the stock markets move higher over time. Combined with risk-free rates, these two components essentially define your return. Now, we're talking about a return in the sense of being a passive investor, or returning, we're talking about a return in the sense of what your expectations should be as an investor. You're here on a Thursday night. Philadelphia is a pretty big city. The surrounding areas in Philadelphia have a few million people, yet there's a few hundred people in this room. Just think about it. How crazy is that? We're, giving to, we're having talks on stuff that will change everybody's life. It's about wealth creation. It's about being really... Um, it's about an intelligent argument. It's about an intelligent challenge. It's about learning things that very few people understand, yet in a city of a couple of million people, there's a few hundred people here. And it's not just Philadelphia, it's every city, in the, every city in the country. It's virtually every city in the world. The number of people that take self-directed finance into their own hands, it's minuscule. And that's what's so interesting about these discussions. So anyway, so my goal is to give you, in the next half hour, about five or six really good takeaways. And the first one is just kind of understanding, you know, what asymmetric returns are, what Brownian motion is, because if you understand this stuff and you understand risk-free returns versus, versus positive drift, then all of a sudden you can articulate stock market, you can articulate investing, you can articulate finance better than almost anybody else out there can. So the annual risk-free returns are about 2%. Annual risk-free returns are now around 2%. They're actually a little bit less because bonds have rallied in the last week, notes have rallied. But annual returns, let's just call them 2%, will round up. Positive drift measured over the last three decades is three one-hundredths of a percent per day on average. I'm just throwing some stats at you. I'm kind of a math geek, and so I don't talk about finance as... You'll never hear me talk about technical analysis. You'll never hear me talk about fundamental analysis. You'll never hear me talk about cyclical analysis. All we talk about is is math, because to me, everything can be boiled down. It has to be a math equation. It has to be logical. The, the numbers, the points, have to all add up. So let's call it three one-hundredths of a percent per day. That's times 250 days. That's 7.5% a year, 250 trading days per year. So 250 trading days times three one-hundredths of a percent, 7.5% a year. So that's what you get paid before fees, average going back five decades. That's before fees. Now, fees can be anywhere from 1% to 2% to lots of other things, but that's, it's some number in there. It's close enough just rounding. Since 1990, the average spread between risk-free returns, which are treasury notes, and I'm using 10-year notes because that's the most actively traded product, and market drift is about 4%. That means the market goes up after fees, you make, it's about 6% or whatever, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. It just matters the difference between risk-free returns over time, which averaged, let's say, 4%, the market which averaged almost 8%, whatever it is, the two, one, one subtracted from the other, comes out to 4%. So that's the, what you get paid for taking risk. You take no risk, you make X. You take risk, you make X plus about 4%. And that's the way it's been for the last 30 years. So that's a reasonable look at stock market history. Now, the, what I do in this industry and what I try to engage individual self-directors to do is to say, throw that all in the garbage and just think about markets and think about them opportun opportunistically and think about what you can create on your own. But that's for a different discussion. Tonight we're just focusing on the math behind it, which is this 4% number. So over the last 10 years, that 4% number is from 1990 to 2019, or 1989 to 2019. Over the last 10 years, that number has ballooned to 10%. So the difference between risk-free rates and what the market has paid in the last 10 years is over 10%. That's historically a huge number. That's historically a number that's two and a half times any number we've seen in the history of the stock market. Now, we had a huge meltdown in 2008. The market went... And, you know, between the end of 2008 and early 2009, March of 2009, the market sold off and it was, it was, you know, it was, let's call it once in a decade type of thing or once in 20 or 30 years. And it was a brutal sell-off. So we're going from a very low point in the market. But for the last 10 years, from, because you can't change the numbers, from 2009 to 2019, the spread between, between risk-free rates and positive drift has been over 10%. That's about two and a half times 
Okay, well, let me finish this first. So that means the current bull market has performed abnormally well given historical averages. Historical averages of 4%, it's given you 10%. That's a huge difference. That's two and a half times higher than at any other point in stock market history. So why is that interesting? If prices are not mean reverting, and price is not mean reverting because that's not a math equation, then why is it, why is it significant? It's, it's significant because it's interesting. It's significant because, because as, as consumers and as interested parties and as engaged investors, we think about things and we look for things that are extreme. We're contrarians by nature. So since price is not mean reverting, if you're banking on a gambler's fallacy, which just means if something goes up, it has to go down because, because it's gone up too much, that's not fair. If something, if you roll, if you, if you flip coins up in the air, and you come up heads, 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 and you do eight heads in a row, it does not mean that the ninth toss has to be tails. It's still a 50-50 shot. So the gambler's fallacy is betting that the ninth, that the ninth flip is going to be tails. It doesn't work that way. In this case, it's the same thing. Just because we've had 10 years of an abnormally strong bull market doesn't mean that year 11 has to be a bad year, because we would have said that two years ago, eight years of an abnormally strong market. Why can't year nine be down? But there's a lot of other factors that are involved today that are really interesting. I'm going to point those out. But banking on a gambler's fallacy is not a reason to make a certain kind of investment. But it is something that you should be aware of. That's what I talked about when positive drift fails. It's almost a, like a, a subplot of when genius fails. But genius fails only based on size. When positive drift fails, super interesting. So first, we believe that the pot odds, now pot odds, for those of you that, have, that gamble at all, pot odds just means that you can have a 50-50 shot sometimes, let's say, in a gambling event, like a poker game or something, and you decide, hey, I'm going to put the money in because the pot odds are in my favor. And then you could have another 50-50 opportunity where you say, you know what, I'm not going to bet on this hand because the odds on the pot, meaning how much money I have in the pot versus what I can take out, I don't like the odds. So pot odds have to be efficient. Pot odds have to be in your favor. So we believe, A, that pot odds are in your favor here because there's a lot more money, and the example would be that there's a lot more money to risk than you can make. It's kind of called convexity in a certain, it's, uh, risk convexity. And the other piece of it here is velocity of risk. Markets go down much faster than they go up. So if the market starts to go down, it's hard to make that back because, because markets go up over a long period of time, like this case, 10 years. Markets can go down over a very short period of time, like six months or a year. So you have velocity of risk combined with what we call pot odds. So the ratio at this point of positive drift to risk, if the ratio of positive drift to risk-free returns were to normalize, then risk-free returns would need to outpace positive drift by two to one over a certain period of time. That just means if we go back and we say, hey, you know what, we're going to go from 10% back to 4%, there would be a complete reversal and bonds or short-term risk-free rates would pay more than the stock market if that was the case. Just to point this out so that ultimately you can walk out of here and articulate it. That would mean a complete reversal of stock market fortunes, which is really interesting because sometimes people look for a reason. You know, what's the reason going to be? What's the reason we're going to be volatile? Is it because we're going into election year? Is it because we're 10 years into a bull market? I don't know. But this is a very interesting case in that you've had 10 years of abnormally high returns on capital without taking an extraordinary amount of risk. At this point now, maybe we've reached the point where the pot odds and the velocity of risk suggest something a little bit different. So what could be the catalyst for the next market sell-off? Because this is where we get into the completely subjective end of it. There's nothing here that, that, nothing here that ties up math-wise. It's just subjective, and it's just discussions. It's red flag talk. So we believe it starts, and this is important for me because this is what we preach. We believe it starts with a massive transition from passive investing to active investing. Now, for one person, active investing can mean just selling calls against a long portfolio. For another pe per person, it can mean you're actively trading your account. For, for another person, it can mean you're actively shifting funds around and moving from one thing to another. I call it getting engaged with your own capital and doing it yourself. 
I'm a huge believer that individual investors should be managing their own money, at least at some capacity and as much of it as they can, no matter what, under any circumstances, because the upside to that is far greater than returns. And there's virtually no wealth creation unless you learn how to make decisions and take risk. And we're all here about wealth creation. So I believe the first thing we're going to see, we're at 99% of investors right now are passive. That number is going to change. It's going to change dramatically when passive investing doesn't outperform active. We're also becoming smarter. The technology is better. The markets are better. And the math is finally starting to make sense. We're done with people saying, hey, you know what? Here's a subjective view of the market just because person A says this. You know, we, on our show, we have zero guests. We don't have any guests. You know why? Because we don't care what they think. Because it doesn't mean anything. I don't care what somebody else thinks. Because there's nothing, there's, there, there has to be something to back it up. I love intelligent arguments. I don't care what other people think about the market. I don't care if somebody thinks the market's going up. I don't care if somebody thinks the market's going down. I always like to tell this story that a few years ago I was, I was, um, um, I, I, we don't have any cable in our office either. So we run a network with zero cable. So we can't watch Bloomberg, we can't watch CNBC, we can't watch anything, we can only watch our own stuff. So I play this game really hardcore. But a few years ago, um, when, when I built my last platform, we put one of the networks on there, and one of the networks that was on there was CNBC at the time. We were the first ones to put them up there. I thought it would be cool to show some kind of content. Well, quick little story. Um, I had a pretty big position on in the euro, just euro options. I was short a lot of puts in the euro options. And one of the guys on the trade desk said to me, hey, this guy who's coming up next is going to talk about the euro. And he knew I had a big position on the euro. He goes, you should watch this. So I, I put the, I mean, the TV's on right in front of me. It's up on the wall. I start watching it. And he goes, um, what do you think about this guy? And I said to him, well, he owes me $5,000. He was my bookie. He was living in his car when I lent him $5,000. So now he's telling me what the euro's going to do. I don't think it works for me. I tell that story because that's, those are your experts. Those are your experts. This was my old bookie. Um, so it has to be math. So I believe in brains over bots. And I listen to this discussion all the time. In fact, I just had an email with somebody a few minutes before I came here. And the discussion was on, you know, AI versus um, AI versus, you know, what, what about AI? Elon Musk says, well, AI is going to, you know, weapons of mass destruction kind of with respect to individuals doing certain things. In an efficient marketplace, AI is way more emotional than individual investors. In an efficient marketplace, there's nowhere for AI to go. AI works in an inefficient marketplace. AI doesn't work in an efficient marketplace. It's just really hard to outperform efficiency. You can take advantage of inefficiency. It's hard to outperform efficiency. So I spoke at a conference earlier, earlier this year in 2019 at, um, up the street from here at the CIA. And the conference was at, the conference, the title of the conference was about, the entire conference was about machine learning and artificial intelligence. I was the only non-classified person at the conference. So it was really interesting because when I went up, a big giant sign went up and said non-classified. And when I was sitting there, you know, before that, everybody else said classified, and they had to make a decision with each speaker whether or not I should sit there. I didn't understand anything they were saying anyway. But what was fascinating about it was when I talked, I talked about the efficiency of AI in an, in an, in an efficient marketplace versus the efficiency of AI in an inefficient marketplace. And nobody had ever heard that discussion before. And it was an hour-long lecture about how AI in a marketplace doesn't work. And what's so interesting about that is you carry that on to other things, like at the CIA, just as an example, and it was the first time in front of, you know, four or 500 people, anybody had heard a discussion about how artificial intelligence can't outperform human brains, the human brain, when you have to program for emotion. It's very interesting. It's kind of crazy. So what I did here is I looked at a IBM's Watson, and I looked at, you know, just because there's, a, because there's an ETF that tracks IBM's Watson, and looked at it against the S&P 500. So in blue is the S&P 500. In red is the ETF that tracks IBM's Wa IBM Watson. Versus, and so I compared the two together. Just to show you, just to give it kind of, you know, to show you that the, that the thought that you're disadvantaged, this has nothing to do with buying the S&P or not trading the Watson or whatever it is. I couldn't care less. What this shows you is, that you are, as an individual investor, you are not disadvantaged towards some computer. 
the technology at your fingertips, the fee structure and the cost at your fingertips, and the content that's available today completely levels the playing field. So when you look at this, there's no advantage to the best you know, supercomputer in the world. But what's more important is how about a really simple strategy where it's active over passive. So the next slide just shows, on the slide on the left, shows one put versus 100 shares, one short put versus 100 shares of spiders, okay, over, a, I think it's a 14-year period. So over 14 years, including a meltdown in 2008 to 2009, the single short at the money put, okay, this is not a complex active strategy. It's a single short at the money put versus 100 shares of stock is essentially a wash. Now, the difference is, if you look at that blue line, it is very flat. That means the volatility of that return is incredibly stable. When you compare that to the yellow line, the volatility of that long stock is way, the, the end result is exactly the same, but the volatility of the long stock is, is way crazier. There's a lot more swings. In fact, that short put has 30% less volatility than the long stock. When you look at the second slide on the right, that's a portfolio with 100% stock versus a 60% allocation to short puts in the S&P. Higher probability of success, lower volatility, and you end up with a massive increase in return for a very simple short put selling strategy versus the S&P, which is just a long position. When you start to think about that and you, and, you, and you play that out, you're like, okay, that's not rocket science at all. In fact, that's as simple a strategy, selling one put every 45 days as any strategy can be. Get it outperformed the S&P, even if you include 2008 all the way through, to the bull, through this crazy bull market all the way through 2019. But the acceleration of risk is very real. And here's some of the factors that excite us. Now, the reason I say excites us is because most people, when you talk about an acceleration of risk, the first thing they do is they go hide. The first thing they do is say, hey, you know what? Get me out because an acceleration of risk means I'm uncomfortable. But risk is not something that's predictable. You don't know when risk is gonna happen. It's impossible to plan for risk. All you can do is be smart and keep your size in check, but you can't actually plan for risk. So what's so interesting about this is we don't consider it risk, we consider it opportunity. We consider it excitement. When everybody else is scared, that's when you should be excited because you're the few that want to come out and say, hey, how do I take advantage of fear? We've reached the highest level of concentration of wealth, decision-making, and passive shareholders in the history of this country, in the history of global wealth um, asset management and global wealth gathering meaning that the fewest number of people control the most amount of money and have the, and have the most decision-making power in the history of finance. That's insane. There's small groups of 20 to 50 people that control over, over 30 to $40 trillion. It's nuts. Just the big firms alone, five big firms alone, control almost $20 trillion in assets. Traditional final, financial media, I got it, Traditional financial media has become disengaged, not disingenuous, meaning it's not intentional, but they're disengaged because they have to, they're conflicted because of their advertisers, how they finance what they do. See, we finance everything we do through goodwill. You come out, you listen to me talk, you say, hey, you know what? I like what that guy had to say. Maybe I'll do business with him. That's a transfer of knowledge. That's goodwill. The other way of doing business is, hey, somebody puts a commercial on television and then they pay to have their story told. That's not goodwill. That's just, that's, that's just that's being disengaged and not really understanding what you need to do. Politicians need to tell the truth. When we were traders on the floor, we had to honor our word. Uninformed, uninformed is acceptable because some people are just uninformed. That's okay. You haven't got there know-how-wise. Untruthful is not acceptable. All trade is based on certain levels of trust and integrity. In 2019, that's gone out the window. And that's a really scary thing. It starts at the top. You can't have the leader of the free world be unable to tell the truth. And it goes all the way down. And we have to be careful about that because we never want to run the, run the risk of losing what we call the center, being the center of global liquidity. 
because being the center of global liquidity is where we create all of our opportunity. Global liquidity cannot withstand dangerous protectionist or, or nationalistic policies or nationalist policies. Being the financial center of the world is critical to consumer wealth creation. The reason we get to do what we can do is because here in the U.S., we have liquid markets. Nowadays, you can move those servers anywhere, and in two minutes, they can be in Singapore. And then all of a sudden, we're trading overnight, and they're trading during the day. It's not pretty. There's a deteriorating regulatory environment regarding know-how. We need our regulators to have better know-how. We need our regulators to understand what you guys want to do, that you want to do whatever it is that you want to do with your money because it is your money. We have weak financial service boards that run big banks and financial institutions, and they're misguided in the sense that they're unable and unwilling to protect consumers, and we've seen that all the way since 2008, and we have financed them in the process, which is dangerous. We have an unsustainable and inverted yield curve, which means short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, and that's a red flag. I mean, right now, it's an opportunity, but I guarantee you that you go out there and you talk to 100 million investors, and less than a dozen can explain how to trade a yield curve. So you hear it and you read it in the headlines and you see in the Wall Street Journal we have an inverted yield curve, but nobody knows how to trade it. On our platform, we have more people that trade yield curve than any other platform in the world. That's crazy. You know what that is? That's just know-how. That's just content created to get people engaged so that they understand, hey, I can take advantage of this as a retail investor. We have historically low implied volatility, which means our fear gauge is on a historical basis, is at record lows. And why is that important? Because unlike mean reversion in price, mean reversion in volatility is a math equation, which means eventually fear goes up. We have record IPO valuations, which are, as you can see, even recently with WeWork and a few other valuations like that, very unsustainable. And we have a broken corporate tax system, which essentially says, hey, you know what? There's some people that there, there are a lot of people and companies that don't pay very much taxes, but they've created an enormous amount of wealth. And so, hence, we are always dumping money and adding liquidity into the system, which, for no other reason, is just a red flag. So what does an engaged investor do? What are the takeaways from today's discussion? First of all, be early. And you are being early because you're here. Take control of all your money, or at least most of your money, and don't put the decision-making on somebody else. You deserve all the credit when you're right, and you deserve to understand why you're wrong. Never dump that on somebody else. No success is generated that way. Nobody ever got rich, or maybe there's a tiny few number of people that got rich betting on somebody else to do it for them. Learn what strategic investing and what the supporting math is all about because I promise you, it is a math equation. It is a bunch of math equations all strung together. And when you start to think about it that way and you understand the math, you will take a full responsibility for everything that happens to you. Be able to articulate. The most important thing in business, in all of business, is being able to articulate. Everybody's smart. Everybody has great ideas. Everybody's smart, and everybody has great ideas. But the reason people fail is because they can't articulate what they're doing to somebody else. Get active. Trade small. And we say trade small and trade often, because the more times you do something, this is, this is what we call a... Um, the law of large numbers. And the more time you do something, the more times you do something with a certain expected return, the greater your results are going to be over time and the closer that return is going to be. So make decisions, get smarter, and then make faster decisions. Because the most successful people in the world make the fastest decisions. You make fast decisions, you will be successful. And lastly, own all of your own successes and failures. It's something that we don't do here in the States. It's something we don't do globally when it comes to finance. There's only a few cultures where you own your mistakes and you own your failures, and where you own your successes and you own your failures. And it's so interesting to me because I think that culture is going to change over the next decade. So today starts your intellectual challenge. And I hope you all could um, you know, just take a few seconds, take a step back. I know that was super quick. And I just wanted to, because I only had a half hour in time, I usually take a little bit longer to throw in a bunch of stories, but I really appreciate you coming out. I hope you check out our stuff, and thank you so much and enjoy the show.